ahead and get started. Um, so with us today to discuss preservation storage criteria are Jane Mandelbaum from the Library of Congress and Nancy McGovern from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I was trying to look up a, a, a little bit of a profile for the both of you for an introduction here. And I, I know Nancy's head of digital preservation at uh, MIT. Um, but Jane, I couldn't find any sort of uh, profiles or even a directory at Library of Congress. So you guys are a little under the radar. Um, so I'm a little unsure of what your actual uh, title is. I'm assuming it's something preservation related. Um, so so <laughs> go let for me it. just say that I'm obviously not representing the library in my work on this group. So um, I'm participating, I've been participating in the group for a long time, which started when we were all working on NDSA things and NDIP things in the old, old, old days. Um, so what I do here is mainly, um, uh, I work in the office of the CIO on digital projects, so. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, just let me know when you would like me to um, advance the slide. Um, sure. And I think we're we're ready to go. Ready to go? Okay. So can you go to the next slide, I guess? So Nancy, you want to talk when we get to the background part, right? Um, yes. Okay. Okay, so um, what we're talking about today is the preservation storage criteria, which has been an ongoing effort by a small group of people to collect and articulate design attributes um, that you can use when considering preservation storage solutions. So it's not intended to be um, exhaustive or all inclusive or a set of requirements. It's basically just a list of things to consider. And you'll see as we go through the slides that we give some more detail in that area. So <clears throat> how did this get started? Um, basically everything that we're aware of that people do in digital preservation ultimately relies on digital storage, but we found there were no guidelines available to aid in storage uh, selection that was specific to digital preservation storage. And we know that many people in different institutions are in a situation where they're trying to either help define that as part of a bigger group or they're a ask point blank, you know, what do you need for digital preservation storage? So this is an effort to try to help guide people and help people um, <clears throat> themselves understand what the, what the kinds of things are that they might want to consider. So uh, Nancy, do you want to start with the background part? Because I think your part begins before 2016. It does. Um, you can see that there's a strong relationship between IPRES and the work that we've been doing. In part, that's because at the IPRES 2015 in Chapel Hill, one of the things that I convened was a, a, the first that we know of, community conversation on digital preservation storage as a particular focus. And from that, we ended up with the 2016 workshop, um, IPRESS 2016 in Bern. Um, and we had another workshop last year, IPRESS 2017 in Kyoto. And there will be another one, it's going with the versions, version one, version two, version three, we're very, very innovative in our naming. <laughs> Um, and uh, <laughs> there's going to be an IPRES workshop uh, at 2018 this year. And I just learned this morning that there's already a waiting list of 11 people for that workshop. So we're trying to see, uh, wait, there's a two or three at least so far. There's another workshop that's got 11 waiting. But we're, we've filled up, so people are interested. And the conversation has been growing from there. For me personally, I was working on some, um, the um, outer OIS, inner OIS project with El Zaru from the Royal uh, Library in the Nether in the in Denmark. And she has been working on preservation storage for the last long while. And we partnered on that to, and, and it gets directly at some of these relationships that come out in the digital preservation storage criteria. So a lot of us came together after the 2015, there was a sort of let's do a workshop and there's been interest since. We've tried to, with each version, we've absolutely built in feedback that we've gotten. So we were really pleased to hear that NDSA was interested in hearing about it. And we're hoping that as with the Library of um, Congress storage meeting, that we get um, feedback along the way and we work to incorporate it. Back to you, Jane. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> So um, one of the things that we try to do in the criteria is <clears throat> make sure that it addresses both things that consumers would use, which are most of the people on the phone, 
but also people who are basically service providers. In other words, to <clears throat> help both sides understand what the other might want or be able to provide for them. So, <clears throat> and examples of use, as Nancy said, we try to get feedback from people when they say how they wanna use it. And we would actually love to hear from people on the phone as to whether or not they've already used it, whether they have an interest in it, in using it and exactly how they wanna use it, because we believe that it can be used in many different ways. And that's among the things that helps us improve it is getting feedback from people using it. So an examples of the different ways that we either know or hope people are using it is by evaluating, comparing different preservation storage solutions. For example, in situations where somebody has maybe one local copy and are trying to figure out you know, if they want to have another local copy under a different kind of administration, they want one local copy of their stuff and maybe they want another copy as a preservation copy in the cloud. That's part of the use that um, we know people are considering for the criteria. Um, gap areas and existing implementations, you know, if somebody says to you, well, okay, we have this storage for your digital stuff. Is it good enough for long-term preservation? Um, and then informing more detailed requirements. As we said, it, it is itself not a exhaustive um, set of requirements, but it may help you inform requirements. Um, and as a component of instructional materials for helping people teach about digital preservation, and to have conversations um, with IT and other people who are service providers um, to sort of set a common set of things to talk about and to have discussions like we're having now um, within the digital preservation community. So that was this slide, right? Okay, so as part of that, um, we've been trying to work on guiding principles to talk about you know, basically the scoping and what it is about and what it isn't. Um, we can just kind of go through these. And people have questions. I talk really fast. Um, if people want to stop me or ask questions, feel free to just cut me off anytime. If you can, maybe Nathan, you can help me. Sure. Okay. So um, as we said, part of it is uh, intended to apply to diff all different kinds of institutions. Um, organizations that are not necessarily part of, you know, the traditional digital preservation community, but, you know, all kinds of different institutions all over the world doing all kinds of work. And maybe they don't even know they're doing, you know, preservation. Um, but I think we think over time that people will understand that there's a commonality to it. So it's, it's intended to speak to the commonalities of organizations doing things with uh, digital content. Um, it's specifically, and we try really hard on this part, we try to avoid any reference to any particular type of architecture, technology, media, content policy, or vendor choices. So some of the ways some things are phrased are intended to be as broad as possible and not specific. And that's an example of why it's not necessarily a set of requirements that you can just use exactly as it comes out of the box, as it were, because we know that many other people have local situations that um, may require them or they have more specific um, requirements in the areas here. And the other part, of course, is and the flip side of that is not all the criteria are intended to be applicable to all kinds, of, to every single institution. And, <clears throat> okay, sec, next slide. Um, and the one on the top, I think, is the one that's sometimes the hardest to keep in mind. It's not intended at all to be used as a requirements document uh, alone. It's intended, the criteria is intended to be just sort of a list of things to think about, considerations, things that will help you maybe build a requirements document. Um, and it is intended to be a foundation that you can use um, and can be combined with things that are, that are local to you, things that matter to you and different kinds of things. And as Nancy said, um, and try to describe, we, the group is composed of people from different parts of the world with different um, jobs and different backgrounds and that I think helps us put it together because we we know that everybody has different things that they think are important or they're important and inform their own institution and that's why we're also interested in use cases. Yes. Um, and it in, also intentionally doesn't address any other kinds of infrastructure. We know that preservation storage realistically is part of people's IT infrastructure or their content management infrastructure or their whatever, um, <clears throat> whether it's in a cloud or whether it's local or, you know, and that it does not, intentionally does not try to address the relationship between the preservation storage and any other parts of your infrastructure. 
So those are the guiding principles, and um, that's <clears throat> when you look at the criteria, it's important to try to keep those in mind, which we have to remind ourselves of occasionally also. So following up on one of those principles, um, we know that users need to take other kinds of things into consideration. Um, institutional requirements, practices, and policies that are relevant, regulations, laws, and everybody has everybody works within an institution that has different issues related to confidentiality and privacy, what, what kind of access you're offering, um, risk management, and uh, cost issues, and what your financial framework and funding structure is like, and your business continuity requirements. And often business, business continuity requirements often will sort of impact and or sort of interact with preservation storage, because obviously part of the goal of preservation storage is to um, support business continuity for your organization. So often those are the hard parts and the criteria doesn't, does not really, um, uh, obviously doesn't deal with sort of local things. Although we, um, if you go to the next line. Um, so what is the criteria? What are, it's a structured list. Um, our current version 3.0, a uh, candidate uh, list, the one that Nancy described, currently has 65 criteria. Um, each one has a short description, and we're working on sort of putting together references or citations to other standards and external um, documents and practices to be helpful to people. Um, and we are also worked on a set of categories that hope, we hope will make uh, things useful for people. And you'll see that we'll cover that in the next slide. And because we know that um, there are lots of other issues that people have in terms of how they address these things in their own local situations, we're developing a criteria usage guide that's still sort of under development with sort of supporting helpful materials um, for the, some of the other kinds of things that we know people have to work on in conjunction, which is, you know, how do you deal with risks? How do you deal with costs? And how do you deal with um, the level and types of independence that you might want um, among and between your copies um, of your preservation storage digital content. Those are issues that I think we all face or we see in the use cases that we have, and we realize those are things that um, are helpful for people to have some thoughts on. <clears throat> Next slide. Okay, so here are the categories um, that we've come up with. Um, for all of these things, as Nancy said, we're looking for feedback. Um, and at the end of the slides, uh, we have a reference to where our, um, we have a, a public version of our uh, current set of criteria and our candidate criteria. And you'll see the, the criteria categories there. So things you think about the categories, are they useful, are they helpful? Um, do these seem like a good, good set of categories when you look at the criteria themselves? All those things would be helpful for us to get feedback on because that is what we're doing now. We're trying to get feedback on the criteria and the categories. Um, so um, I think these are in alphabetical order. That's my memory of what, that's right. So that I think also helps people who, um, are trying to figure out how to use the criteria in their own environment, because often these kinds of things are kinds of things that you're looking at with different kinds of, um, you know, you're working with an IT department or you're working with your security people or you're working with the people who care about uh, the content. And this is the kind of things that I think helps um, put the criteria into kind of useful categories to think about. So on the next slide, Uh, one of our members did this chart to put the um, uh, criteria into the categories. You can see how many are in each category. Um, and you'll see that security ended up being the one with the most uh, criteria. Um, I think that sort of shows where we are sort of in the, the curve of IT and how things work and the um, security of content is a very important part of um, everybody's operation. Um, transparency, um, I think, has increasingly been one of the things that um, people are concerned about in terms of making sure that um, from the consumer side, if you're the person um, whose content is um, being held on preservation storage, 
Um, do you get enough information so that you feel that you are comfortable um, with how your content is being managed? Uh, scalability and performance. Um, I think everyone who, who <clears throat> deals with digital storage um, has that as an issue. Um, and uh, it's obviously an important part of trying to figure out um, how you estimate you know, what kind of storage you need, how much it's gonna cost, what it's gonna look like. And those are obviously hard things to make an estimate on from anybody, um, but that's obviously an important thing to at least try to um, put into some kind of a concept that is meaningful to you. And then you'll see all the other ones uh, fall below that. I did have a question on this, uh, on the categories, if you have a moment to answer uh -huh. that. Yep. Can you explain to me the difference between resilience and content integrity? They seem to be sort of pretty, at least pretty close to each other, if not kind of the same thing. Nance, you want to talk to that one or? I'll try. Um, the resilience is, is a lot broader. Um, it, it has, so the content integrity gets specifically at some of the the um, fixity and things like that, whereas resilience has to do more with the provider itself and the coming back up and the downtime and things like that. Um, we went back and forth. We, um, one of the things I think that's changed most in the versions is the, the first version didn't have categories. The second version had categories. And as we know, every subject classification is subjective. <laughs> so <laughs> we're finding that things kind of shift around a lot. Um, it, having categories we, it does seem to be helpful rather than a list in some arbitrary or alphabetical order um, of you know, all the criteria. But um, we, ha we don't feel like it's, it's quite done yet. So you probably could make a good case if you look closely at those for shifting one or more of those from resilience into that. But that's, that's how I would characterize the difference. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Categories help a lot, but it sounds like when you talk about resilience, you're, more, you're really more talking about availability then Oh, that's only one one part of it. Let me see if I can. Um... No, that's all right. I, I I I didn't want to take too much time here. I just wanted to ask the quick question. Oh, it's a good question though. But I sure. Go a rat hole here. I apologize. Um, I'll take a look at all of this afterwards, and and if there's you know any suggestions, then definitely we'll give you some. Sure. That would be great. As Nancy said, that's among the things we spend a lot of time on is trying to figure out how to make the criteria you know, easy to use, I mean, you know, make it useful, make different, provide access points for people, you know, that things that are meaningful to them. And so we tried to um, make categories that seemed, as you say, useful, but, you know, obviously there's some amount of overlap. Um, the other part, although this, I think sounds silly, Nancy, you can correct me if it's wrong, I think we tried to use words that were as simple as possible, and it sounds kind of stupid, but to try to make things as clear as possible. Um, and we spend a lot of time on that, I think. Yeah. We're trying to make it, I mean, because it does come out of the international context, some of the feedback we got in the various iterations did get at the ways in which terms are used, not surprisingly. Yeah, that's right, right. Um, and the, and there had been, a, initially, there was more kind of almost pushback on, um, a, a lot of people would sort of stop at information security and the other ones are very important depending on your situation. Right. Um, sort of like with an OAS standard, um, you, you can't get, the reason that we, we that it, the criteria are not, uh, not sp specified so that they, they might relate, like you take the criteria and you say, this is how it relates to me, because otherwise immediately you get right into a very local context of what people need and what they're looking for. The other thing I think that you realize, you know, over time is, as Nancy said, sometimes, you know, in one part of your cycle of, you know, working through your issues, really, you know, you might find that, you know, one of these categories is more important and over time, uh, you know, some wane, some whack, you know, depending on where you are in your cycles and, um, you know, what your, what your local problems are. And I think that was the other part we tried to do was to make it flexible enough so that you could um, focus on specific things that you know matter to you in one in in your in where you are in your cycle of dealing with content and in what your role is. 
and what you know what your bosses want so yeah I think it's ready for the next one. Unless... Okay. Oh, can I sneak in a question? Sure. Um, are the categories all mutually exclusive or, um, or do the criteria ever, I'm sorry, are the cri criteria mutually exclusive uh, to the categories or are, do any of the criteria um, cross categories and multiple categories? We actually added a column so that we could do some cross referencing. <laughs> and there's been a number of, so depending on the, on the category that we find it's, it should be in, we act, there are a couple cases when there's a criteria that's phrased this way for this category and this way for that category. So we might, we try to make it so that each criteria has, has a reason for being, but we also have a lot more cross references as we go along or to understand this criteria, see this section or see this other other criteria that it directly relates to. Does that get at your question? Yeah, I, I was thinking there are some that, that could be applicable in different categories and different contexts, but sort sure. of represent the same thing. So that different helps. aspects of it. That's what yes, we were exactly. like from this, yeah, understand with different lenses. So the categories mm -hmm. almost provide a lens for the, the, the criteria. And we did find that we had to separate some out. One of the, some of the most interesting conversations that we've been having for me have to do with independence and the different ways that mm -hmm. independence come into play for preservation storage to the to the extent that we've pulled it out and made it a special section and the kind of usage guide is I think going to be one of the biggest things that gets is the biggest change between version two and version three and I think it's um, where we'll also be able to capture a lot of community discussion. Right so when we talk about independence uh, and after you can tell me I mean the, the conversations arose around the issues of um, the sort of deep question, which I know comes up explicitly some places, but implicitly basically everywhere, which is if you have more than one copy of your digital content, how do you make sure that um, the two copies are different enough or independent enough from each other that you are addressing whatever risk might come up in either technical or security or in fact all of these other categories. And yeah. that's I think one of the things that um, is one of the challenges of both trying to think about the criteria and your preservation storage um, solutions. And it's also one of the things that's the hardest to um, actually implement. So that concept of independence is a really important part of what we were trying to address. And, and it, it's a use case that some people articulate, but that I think is actually um, applicable to basically anybody who has more than one copy of, you know, what their preservation storage is. Yeah. And it comes up obviously a lot in the question that's the mo often the most common, which is, you know, I have a copy of my stuff on our local, you know, server, data center, whatever it is, and I'm thinking about putting another copy somewhere. What does that mean? And the independence part of that is a really important part of that. Right. And that's the that's why part of the reason transparency is so important is because many people feel that the only way that they can assure that their two copies are quote unquote independent and they have a, that they have basically a strong preservation storage solution by having two copies is how do they make sure that those copies are you know, independent enough, the only way they, many people feel that they can ensure that for themselves and sleep at night is the transparency of getting adequate information about and from each of those copies, both in terms of what it looks like when you acquire it and also in terms of operations. How do they make sure that the information they're getting is adequate to make sure that they feel that those copies are in fact operating differently, differently and independently? Yeah. So the simple question of, you know, should I put another copy in the cloud um, carries with it a lot of those explicit and implicit issues of, you know, basically why are you going to do it? <clears throat> and if you're going to do it, um, can you make sure that it's independent and um, transparent enough that you're comfortable that that you get the, you know, that that is itself um, a good preservation storage solution? 
kind of related to that one, one of the other really interesting threads, it ties to cloud. There have been a lot of questions about including a specific section or set of criteria about cloud. And that goes back to the, we're not presuming any specific implementation at all, but right. also the cost considerations. What we're finding is, and we're trying to point to as many resources as we can, is that there are really much better cost estimates for storage at rest than storage plus services. And when we get into preservation storage discussions, of course, we're getting into the service layer as well. When we talked about the very first version of the storage criteria, there was some real surprise by some of the people who came to the workshops and the discussions that we were talking about more than really straightforward storage understood as IT storage considerations. We're getting into much more sometimes governance, sometimes you know the transparency issues, the the whole the holistic look at preservation storage, really the way in which archival storage is, is represented um, within OAS um, in, in the right. ways it connects to the other functional areas. Nance, can you, um, I'm just for the, for the notes, I'm trying to capture sort of what you were just getting at a little bit um, and, and about the cost projections for, for storage at rest rather than storage with services. Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of mentioning here about thinking, thinking about it that way, or how would you sort of encapsulate that thought? Um, think about your, your cost projections for storage at rest rather than storage services. Oh, no. Think about, um, understand when you get an estimate that you might be only getting storage at rest, which is the most knowable um, content. It's just your, your, your file is sitting there. But if you're running Fixity, that's storage with services. If you're running, if you're interacting with the content, and that's where the, the, the frequency of, fre of how often you run, um, you do Fixity checking, the frequency with other kinds of services that you might associate with preservation storage are the sort of unknowns. Um, what kind of, like we're, we're doing, uh, for MIT, we're doing levels of preservation commitment. And for our most um, significant, you know, that's a loaded word, but for our, you know, institute records and confidential data and things, um, we're doing, it's a lot less content than it is for, than other categories, but it's the highest frequency of services. So it's a higher cost, but on a lower amount of content. So thinking about when you a lot of, just be aware that when you get an estimate, understand what it's telling you. Like it very specific things about how often the service would be run if there are any services. Um, do you have to take content out to run services and put them back? Uh, we're at a point of transition, absolute transformation in preservation storage providers from a very much a monolithic situation to a very distributed one. And the distributed digital preservation part of this is what Elzaru and I were tackling in the OOIO model stuff. It's, there's lots of different moving parts. There's lots of providers that are getting into it. And one of the aspects of independence is not relying on only local, of course, but also not necessarily on um, only one provider. Um, what the, the entire understanding of independence and how we achieve it, especially for born digital content, for example, where you might be going for more number, we would certainly be going for higher numbers of copies. Thank and you. I'm not sure that that answered your question. <laughs> no, no, it did. It did very much. Thank you. So, right. I mean, what you, what, I mean, I think most, many people find themselves in a situation where somebody, you know, raises their hand and says, but hey, you know, I can buy five terabytes for this amount and I can operate it for this amount. You know, what, what's the pro, you know, why do you think it's such a big deal to have preservation storage? And you try and, as Nance says, you have to understand that just, you know, being able to buy five terabytes, you know, on you know, eBay or whatever it is, that's not, that's not what you're trying to do for preservation storage. Yeah, we, the, the conversation last year at the Library of Congress storage meeting was really fascinating, but there were whole, by design, there's a hundred, different kinds of participants in that conversation. And a number of the um, people who may, providers who may have viewed themselves as storage providers and are now trying to understand what a digital preservation storage provider might mean, were really stunned that there would be any reason to tell anybody that there were errors. Right. And that they wouldn't just be 
expected to fix them, whatever that means. You know, the notion for me that somebody would decide what to do if they found an error in my preservation copies is really um, troubling <laughs> without the communication. So that's where we get into the service um, support and that's where we get into transparency. Right, and those same providers, right, they understand that it's going to cost them money and resources and it's a lot of work to do some of the things that the preservation storage might require. And so that's why it's important for the you know, community to have those requirements and articulate them and make it clear that that is what, you know, what people need, as Nancy said. Um, and that's part of, I think, also the goal of this. Yeah. Yeah. I guess um, this is, I'll mention it now, and then I think we only have a few slides up, but so the, I mentioned the MIT project that we're working on. It's called Comprehensive Digital Preservation Storage, and we have gotten, I'm thrilled that we have high level approval to go forward with implementing it. We have levels of preservation commitment that I would be happy to share our example for that. It's not something that everybody would be up, but the more content you have, the more the more important it is to think about what level of service you need and, and want to try to achieve. So we're going with our institute records, our regulated and confidential, and our open institute records as our top um, categories. And we've identified providers to work with on that. And one of the providers, one of the things that we're going to be working out with them is that they're going to do, they're going to partner with us on an experiment to try to figure out a better model for figuring out storage with plus services. Um, they, they, were, they were very upfront and said, we can't provide you with a great estimate for the, for the service part. And I don't believe anybody can. And that really got us thinking. And we, some of the conversations we had about the criteria happened at, for me after that conversation. I think, I think what we have to expect from providers is really being upfront and acknowledging that we're in a trans, transitioning period for them, for us, for our collections. A lot of people are going to more heterogeneous collections with different kinds of needs and, and criteria. Then moving very far away from one size fits all for preservation storage or any other part of digital preservation. Right, and I think as Nancy says, you start expanding your collections and looking at them. There's the issue of, you know, the quote unquote, you know, you can value or <clears throat> consider some of them more significant. Also, the types of content that you have also can make a difference as to, you know, what the provider can do for you. You know, it's a lot harder, for example, ever to do knows to fix CD on a huge file than it is on a small file. And so a lot of those issues that, you know, are the service issues also sort of, there are lots of ways of looking at how you would make sure you get the services you need, depending on the type of content you have how often you want to do things with them. As Nancy said, the other part, of course, bringing it in and out of the storage, all those issues are things that come up as part of preservation storage, but that are hard to necessarily put together as a <clears throat> linked set of requirements from the very beginning, unless you think them through carefully. Yeah. And that's also why the criteria are intended to speak to both the consumers and providers, so that it's sort of mutually um, <clears throat> mutually available for discussions. And, and one of the things that's really important is that it also includes our local providers that we're not necessarily used to including. That there's sort of like a given of, oh, well, they're IRT and they just do it for us. Well, gosh, that's been some of the more interesting conversations that we've had. And what we did is we used version two of the criteria. Version three is still fluid. <laughs> Almost, almost not, but it's been fluid. Um, so we use version two, and we had we went through the criteria with our the people who provide um, uh, local storage for us, and it was fascinating. We went from an understanding that was really based, really, really based on um, uh, access storage, and and became a conversation about preservation storage, which was great. Carry on with the slides. Yep. 
So um, this is a list that uh, <clears throat> some of the other people in our group put together of uh, examples of uh, some of the criteria that they thought were good for having conversations around. Um, and obviously I won't read them. The C just means I think it's that's the criteria. And these, those are um, two out of the uh, 65 that go along with some of the different things that we were talking about, the organizational independence, um, allowing audits. That also deals with the transparency part. Um, a lot of these issues have to do with, in fact, the uh, transparency and independence part. You know, saying where the number 58, exposing the location of where your storage is, which is very important uh, to certain institutions and in depending on what their laws are about where your stuff can be or where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, how much you get notified and what kinds of data errors you get notified of, something Nancy referred to before, and what, you know, what they tell you about what those errors are. Um, some people find, you know, the issue of exporting your content from one uh, solution to another, how that works, and how you do replication of your content. So this is, these are examples of some of the things that um, have become important. Um, and they aren't necessarily things that are, um, you know, as Nancy said, you're going to get any particular provider say, yep, we can do that, yep, we can do that, yep, we can do that. Those are just things that people have found are important to them and once you can articulate them and those are things that are the kind of thing that are worth thinking about and having discussions with your providers about. Yeah. So next steps, um, as Nancy said, we're working on version three. We have a um, version, I think it's in the next slide, um, out for public content, public meaning, people on the NDSA calls and other people that we are going to work with that. I think IPRES and I think also at um, the DigiPres meeting, I think, November, I think. I think so. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to get as many comments as we can um, from, um, people. Um, feedback from anybody on this call would be great. Um, and uh, one of the things, as Nancy said, we're trying to improve is um, find as many good people who have use cases as possible, because that obviously helps us and helps us um, understand how people are using them. And I think helps other people who are trying to use them. It's good to have people um, explain how they're using them so that can help other people try to use them also. Yeah. One of the things I'm, I know many of you, many of us are involved in the NDSA levels of preservation revision, and um, this is the kind of document that we'd expect that to link to um, because it does address storage. We don't want to replicate in the levels of preservation the specificity of these kinds of documents, but we, that's how we see it plugging into things. And right. Jane, you're, you're the, there will be the, the um, storage conference again this year, and there yep. will be um, notes and things that come out from that afterward. Mm -hmm. Yep. We think that the version that we go into the IPRES workshop with will be 3.0, and as usual, and how we've <laughs> kind of been carrying on is, we'll probably start working on version four right after, right after that. Oh, probably during the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> that will save time. Right. <laughs> okay. I think the next slide shows the, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, as with other parts of the NDSA, we had also started looking at open science framework as a um, place to um, put a, a version of our stuff. So that's what's listed there. We also have a Google group. Um, that we encourage people to join, um, that we send out communications to and get people, try to use that as people to talk about. Um, and then the conferences and uh, forums, which is going to be presented, the IPRES 2018, Nancy is one of the leaders of. Uh, PASIG, I'm not sure where PASIG is this year. Mexico sure. City. Yeah, Mexico. there you go, exactly. That's why I didn't know where it was, right. And then of course, through these NDSA working groups, so. Yeah. So one of the things about IPRES 2018 is that for the first time we're doing full, open, comprehensive proceedings. And so the workshop materials will be posted up through IPRES 2018, so all the slides and things. So if you're not, we hope to see everybody in Boston and Cambridge, but if you're not able to attend, we're going to try to put just as much, not only for workshops, but for the whole of the whole of the program up in um, 
and OSF, and we're going to be trying to have a full set of Google um, Doc notes for each of the sessions. So the workshop is on, uh, that's Monday, the September 24th, right? Yes, it is. A, a date that is ingrained in my head. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> they are, uh, it's, we, it's really, I was very pleased that we just opened um, specific workshop sign up on Friday and, the, and we already have a wait list for that. That's great. <clears throat> Any questions? I see Jesse Johnston from the library has a question. I didn't see what it was. I couldn't read the whole question. So Jesse says, you've mentioned um, LODP, levels of, levels of digital preservation, and OAIS. Could you talk about how you see these criteria in relation to these other documents? Since you mentioned they are not yet requirements documents, um, are they extensions, complements, interim documents? Just, I'll take a stab, Dan, you can tell you what, what you think. Um, we see this as, as filling a specific niche that hadn't been addressed, the things very specific about how do you stand up and manage preservation storage. We, we're not trying to ever make these a requirements document. I just want to make sure we're clear about that. Right, right. The local, the, <laughs> The local local application of them produces a request for information or a request for proposal or you know gets into very specific but we're like the OAS approach of it's generalized so that everybody can use it the criteria format we're going to, we would keep to um, as far as it being generalized and applicable for everyone now some people have told us that, that that they don't need as much of the transparency stuff for whatever reason for us for our institute records we have to have a you know, the location part has to be, you know, transparent location has to be there or we can't use certain kinds of um, storage. So it's very much you pick and choose the parts that are appropriate to you. And then you turn those things into requirements. That's the process that we went through at MIT. We, we looked at the, at the criteria and said, all right, for this. And, and there's a difference between the criteria, I mean, the requirement that we might come up with for our local copy which is our preservation storage master and, and other kinds of backups that would be managed by other kinds of providers. So we don't intend for it to be a, a, a requirements document. It's not like that's the next step for it. We would like to point to people's requirements documents so that people can see in other kinds of uses. That's where the use cases come in for that. But so for instance, in the in the in revising the levels of preservation, we definitely would see this as if you're working on this you know, these rooms and these columns, look at this would be a document to refer to. So it's meant to supplement um, the, the existing set of standards and practice that we have. It's meant to um, be generally applicable, but local, locally specifiable. I mean, we're trying to make it so that you can take it up and make it local. I don't think that we're, we're not at this point looking at taking it to become an, it's more like a community um, standard in the way of premise, which isn't yet an ISO standard for sure, but it is, um, it's meant to be for the community, by the community. Um, and I don't know what more formal format it will take as a standard um, beyond what we're doing. Right, <clears throat> right. And I, I'm not, I wouldn't even use the word standard. I mean, I just, I, no. yeah. I, mean, I consider it, just, it's just a list of stuff you might consider. I mean, I, I, tr I try to dumb it down because I think it can be used in conjunction with the levels. It can be used in conjunction with OAS. I don't think it's intended to. Oh, you know, absolutely. Yeah, it's it doesn't. Kind of int a, it's kind of a layer that might go, go along with using OAS. Yeah. Um, the nature of standards and practice, more the practice part. Right. It, I think that's right. Right. That's a good way to put it. And that was, you know, I was on the original levels group, and I can tell you that that started very similar to this. It was really just intended as a quick and dirty, easy way to talk about, you know, digital preservation. That's all it was intended to be. Yeah. And in this case, we're trying to make sure that people understand that there's more to it than a number of providers or even curators would be aware of if they don't really sit and think through it. So we're trying to help people think through the problem. Right. And make sure that and as, right and they're and they're hard problems i mean these aren't easy things to deal with and these are problems in practice 
rather than, you know, a list of specific standards or whatever. Yep. It's intended to be hard discussion items. You look at the example criteria that's on that was on a couple slides back. Those are not easy problems to deal with. So I think these are really intended as discussion points, as Nancy said, that help institutions and providers talk about the hard concepts of dealing with pre digital preservation and the storage that underlies it. Yep. We're actually getting some very good feed feedback from the best providers I, from, my, from my measure. The ones that are asking really good questions like, oh, what would we have to do then? You know, or yeah. how would we go about some of that thing? Not just, you know, that's ridiculous. We don't have to do that. <laughs> I just want to um, sneak in here for a second. Um, we do have uh, about 10, 11 more minutes for questions, um, but I just wanted to uh, mention uh, before we run out of time and people start leaving the call, um, the uh, security confession survey. Um, the link is in the agenda document and an email went out to NDSA all a couple weeks ago. We could send another one out. Um, because information security, which showed up as one of the uh, highest frequency criteria here, is the topic of our next monthly call. Uh, and Paige Walker, who is facilitating the topic that month, is uh, running an anonymous survey um, asking people to uh, tell us your security disasters and situations um, anonymously if it is within the rules of your institution to, uh, to do so. We don't want anyone to, to risk their positions. Um, but uh, if it's a little more comfortable for anyone to talk about those things anonymously, um, thinking that might be a way to do it um, about where there were problems and how they were mitigated. But it's a quick survey, three questions, and then another one if you're willing to actually talk about it on the call. Um, but uh, please take a look at that. Um, there was an email, there's a link on this agenda, and uh, we'll send a reminder out um, try to get one sent out or, uh, sometime this week. Um, all right, back to questions. If you have any, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have one if no one else does. <laughs> well, go for it. <laughs> all right. um, so in the, um, the document, um, I, and I, it's been a while since I spent some time with version two. Something that was never explicitly called out, but is sort of implicit in several of the criteria was um, a file system. You know, the, the file system on which the content is stored, whether it is um, XFAT or XFS or ZFS or BetterFS um, or the the actual file system, and now there's these newer um, sort of abstraction layers of file systems. And that's, uh, from a research point, that's something that's always interested me, and I was sort of surprised there was nothing directly referencing file systems as a criteria. And I was just curious if you could talk about that a bit. I'll start, Jane, you, you jump in. Um, we do call it out in version three, in a, in a general way, um, one criteria where it comes up is interoperability and flexibility. Um, it's, not, it's number nine. Um, but um, we try really, first off, we try really hard not to get into specific things, partly because it will become outdated very quickly. Um, but also to, to, um, to, to have it be as generalized as possible and to not make assumptions about how people are going about it. So in that case, we actually list out some of the things that you talked about as examples so that people can understand, but not as um, a, a specific discussion of it. That's where you get into the local implementation and how people go about things. The other one where it comes up in version three is because I think there was a similar sense of people asking about those things from um, certainly last year in Kyoto and at the other we, we talked at it three of the similar kind of three or four places last year. There's another criteria called f file systems limits and, the, and the, the ways in which those systems actually impose things that are hard to work with for preservation storage, like um, long file names and path and directory names and amount of files and ba some bandwidth issues in, in, in fact. Right, I think we try, I remember discussing that from my point of view, I would just as soon not have the word file system or even that concept in there 
because I think in the future it won't necessarily exist. And I think that the, you know, the performance and scalability things of the requirements, the kind of things that Nancy just mentioned, ideally you would not even necessarily have to talk about the concept of file system to get at those things. Agreed. So that's an example of something that would ideally not appear in there at all. It, perhaps in the in the very very implied ways in which I would just those examples. Right, I think, right, that's right. But, but not specifically about file systems as as storage right. providers. Right, and a lot of the storage providers act as if the concept of file system doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily a requirement for storage, and a lot of them are moving towards situations where they won't use that word or prefer not to. Right, and right, so, and that's. That's the difference, I think, in a lot of the cloud storage is it tends to be object storage, which is sort mm -hmm. of a, a software layer. So, it, you know, a file system doesn't even matter. Or if it is, it's a virtualized file system anyways, um, depending on how you're using it. So, okay, that, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm going to actually have to jump off because I have an iPress 2018. <laughs> 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 but I thank you, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jane. You did a great job. Thanks. Thank you Thanks. both very much for your time. This was a great, uh, great conversation and great presentation. If people have questions afterwards, they're always happy to address them. So, but thank you yeah. very much for having me. Bye. Thank you, Nancy. Bye. Bye. Um, and uh, Nancy and Jane's uh, emails are linked to in the um, agenda. Um, under their names on the agenda portion. You can click on those to send them an email if you have any follow-up questions. Um, we just had a couple little other items here on the agenda. Um, nothing really much to talk about here. Just as an FYI, the um, storage survey working group proposal, um, this has come up the past couple of meetings. This is uh, probably the last time it will come up in this form. Um, there was a proposal sent to the NDSA coordinating committee. Um, they're taking a look at it. Um, by the end of this month, I think they're going to be done with it. Um, but anyone can, can take a look at that and make a comment. Uh, the link is in the agenda document. Um, so that should be coming forth. You might hear back about from, um, what the next steps are um, next month um, with this group. Um, also, uh, we do have a date and time for our working lunch in October where we won't be having a regular call we'll, um, for those who will be at DigiPres 2018 um, Thursday, the uh, October 18th at 1145 a.m. Um, we'll be ha doing a working lunch um, talking about planning for the upcoming year um, and anything else we need to talk about. Um, was there anything uh, anyone Anyone else wanted to talk about today on the call? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you uh, again to Jane um, and our best to Nance again uh, and have a great day everyone. Thank you. All right, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. So, thank you for your work. Bye. Bye-bye.